Chapter 13 Abraham and Malaluth's Law The family went across the plains of Damascus, over the anti-Lebanon mountain range, and settled in the Beka Valley in the town of Zul. Seemingly unhappy with his surroundings, Ibrahim al Maluf picked up stakes again and went to live with his family in the high mountains of northern Lebanon. The route to Sari was a hard one. They rebuilt the village that had been abandoned before their arrival and named the new settlement Duma in memory of Maluf's village in Horan. Since then a church that revered St. Sarkis was also built in the new village, however trouble was looming for the family. Soon after the murder of a ruler in Tripoli, he was denied the hand of one of our Maluf's daughters. The family was forced to leave the region and seek refuge with the emir, who had developed a friendly relation with our Maluf in the Kurzivin district. The village of Fakarab, established by the Maluf family circa 1560 AD, the first four sons settled in the village of Hadizi in 1550 AD, one could see the entire valley from their homestead. Their observation led to part of the family moving to Farakab in 1560 AD, where they established their homes. Dan Gustavo and Damienus were now walking in the direction of a residence in ruins. Is that one of Maloof's houses? Dan asked. Yes, Dan, fourteen generations separate. The souls who lived in this house and the men and women who have contributed to the economical and political growth of Lebanon. The family was highly educated. Whether we are talking about professional careers such as law or engineering or the arts such as poetry and historical research, everyone, men or women, prided themselves in being educated. I guess Abi Raji was true to his name, wasn't he? Gustavo noted. Damienos nodded, but Dan frowned. How did he or his descendants contribute to the ruling of the Ottoman Empire then? Very good question, Dan, and one that we should discuss presently. From Algeries to the west, to Budapest to the north, Zella in Africa to the south, to Baku on the Caspian Sea, the Ottoman Empire succeeded in acquiring many of the territories surrounding the Mediterranean over nearly four centuries. Nevertheless, and as I said, they could not restore the Roman Empire, and most importantly, Italy was never part of their territories. They stopped walking. Any reason for this? Yes, Gustavo, Italy was not only difficult to access, but the land was dedicated to God and his church by the 12th century when Ottomans were trying to invade the territory surrounding Italy. Besides, there were huge powers in Europe to the north and east that wouldn't have allowed further incursions. So what role did al Maluf play during the Ottoman reign, to be recognised as a ruler? It is not so much what he did, but how he did it, Dan, the valley you see in front of you, Damienos' arm travelled across the panorama, is perhaps a very good representation of what was happening in the 16th and 17th century around the Mediterranean states. Damascus, as powerful as it was at the time, was located in the depth of the valley of Syria. It was easy prey for the Emperor Selim I, but located in the mountains of northern Lebanon, the new ruling government could not oversee the remote villages of the region. So al Maluf, the highly respected Ghassanid, devised a system of jurisprudence which saw to the rightful balance between central and local authorities. It was designed to allow the integration of cultural and religiously diverse groups. The empire designed a three-court system, one for Muslims, one for non-Muslims, involving Jews and Christians ruling over their respective communities. And the third was overseeing the trade courts, the system was not based on any of the religions, but on a system dating back to the pre-Islamic era called the Yasa, which had been the system used by the Ghassanids before the advent of Christianity. That's amazing, Dan said. Truly amazing. Dan looked over the valley again. He was really a man of God, wasn't he? I wonder why his name is not mentioned in the royal appointment, though. In a way, it is comprised in the mention of the Hashemite royal house in Akora. Damianos reminded him. When we get to the hotel tonight, perhaps you could read a little more about the Ottoman Empire. Sure will, Dan agreed. And isn't the fact that the empire was the longest lasting government in power in history? Yes, it was. It was dissolved at the issue of World War I in 1920. Wow, Gustavo exclaimed. You mean these guys ruled for seven centuries? 
Precisely, and I believe the main reason for their reign being so long and prosperous in many regards was due to the fact that they used democratic jurisprudence and freedom of religion as per our old Ibrahim al Malouf's recommendations. In the morning, and surprisingly to both Gustavo and Dan, they were no longer in Farakab, admiring the panorama overlooking the valley. They both were awakened by the sound of chants outside their bedroom doors. Gustavo was the first to be up. It didn't take him but a second to realise that he was dressed in a monk's habit, and that he sported a tonsure. He swore under his breath and called Damien as quietly as his anger permitted. "'Tell me I'm dreaming. Please tell me I'm dreaming,' he said, fixing his gaze on the shepherd who had appeared in his cell. "'Keep your voice down, Constanzo. We are back in the seventeenth century. Dan needs to relive Antonio's life for a while. There is something extremely important that will occur in the next little while. Just tell me, Dominus, where are we? In Acerta, Antonio is now the bishop of this province, and he sees no purpose in leading the life of a recluse. But let's not talk about all that in in his absence. Let's go and see if he is awake. As soon as they penetrated the walls of Antonio's comfortable chamber, Constanzo grunted. That's why I don't like the church. Opulence when there should be humility and reflective solitude in a cell like mine. Antonia sat up and stared. Constanzo, I thought you were at the Matins. And Demianos, why the sudden visit? Because, Antonio, I believe it is time for you to open your eyes to the world today. I would love nothing better than doing that, dear friend, but as you can see, although living in relative comfort, I am obliged to live as a recluse. The library no longer holds any attraction for me. I believe I have read all of its volumes twice or three times, and even though the Bible will always be intriguing reading, a man cannot live by bread alone. May I then propose that we retire to the refectory and have a meal of fresh eggs, rashers and milk, Damieno suggested. And if you need warm water for your morning ablution, I will get one of the novices to fetch some from the kitchen. Do not bother, Damianos. Later, I will bathe in the lake waters, such as I do every day. It's a little cold at this time of year, but it's invigorating nonetheless. You should watch not to catch a chill, my brother, Constanzo said. But I am ready for the promised breakfast, he added, turning to Damianos. Very well, then, the latter replied. Let's make haste. They hurried through the corridors of the monastery and soon entered the refectory, which was deserted at that hour. Most of the monks were busy with the gardens around the church and up the slopes surrounding the village. The vineyards were resplendent under the mid-morning sun. "'This is a beautiful sight,' Damienos remarked. "'Are you enjoying your life here, apart from being bored, as you mentioned earlier?' "'No, I am not enjoying my life here. I want to leave, actually.' "'Why would you want to do that, Antonio?' "'Because, Constanzo, I cannot see myself living another day in this place.' I thought you liked it up here. I mean, it's a small village, but the air is fresh, the people are friendly, and your congregation is quite devout. All very good reasons, but I can't help but feeling exiled. I resigned my station in Belcastro because of the Richelieu. I wanted to leave his presence and his impervious command. Humility is not part of his traits of character, Constanzo, but here in Acerta I feel as if banished from all I know, secluded from my flock away from our family. Besides, I love the mountains, and the sea is my protection. I can understand that, Antonio, but you have the freedom to travel or to roam your bishopric as you please. Perhaps you could visit the Archbishop of Naples while you're here. I could arrange for an audience, if you like. That's very generous of you, Constanzo, but I can't ask any favours, not at this point. You could have been excommunicated because I didn't agree with, with the Cardinal, you know that, and I don't think the Archbishop of Naples would want to have anything to do with me at this juncture. What about going down to Salerno? You know, our sister Alicia has her heart set on the mer- that merchant. Maybe you could accompany her on the next journey. Being a chaperone, you wouldn't be suspected or querying favours from a bishop, now would you? Perhaps that is an idea worth considering, Constanzo. I could also pray at the side of St. Matthew's tomb. Antonio turned his face to Damianos, who had remained silent for a while. Perhaps you could dispatch a courier with a message to our dear Alicia and advise her that I intend to take her to Salerno to visit her fiancé at the first opportunity. I don't think it is the right thing to do at this time, Antonio, Damienos interposed quietly, 
just before the cook brought their plates to the table. They're all fresh as can be, Bishop. The eggs are, I mean, and the bread is hot from the oven. I hope you enjoy your meal, brothers. The novice bowed and trotted away happily. How can you not like this? Constanzo said. Look at your plate, it's all fresh, excellently prepared, and it smells divine. The same could be true of a plate that our mother would serve of a morning, Constanzo. My spirit is the one in need of food, not my body. I need to be included in the affairs of the land, in the affairs of the church. I sense conflict is brewing outside our doors, and here I am wallowing in a reclusive but inutile life. May I ask what gave you such a foreboding, Bishop? Damienos asked. I don't know exactly. I don't exactly know, Damienos, but I have to go back to Calabria. This is a must. He fell silent. What is the date? he asked suddenly. Could you tell me the day of the year this is? I believe this is the twentieth day of November in the sixteenth and forty-first blessed year of our Lord, Bishop, Damienos replied. The words hardly escaped his mouth when a young monk entered the refectory, approached the table in a rush and stood in front of the bishop. He was holding a rolled parchment. I am, ver I am so very sorry, Bishop, to interrupt your meal, but a courier has brought this message. It is from the Vatican. Brother Bernardo told me to bring it to you without a moment to spare. Antonio's face paled. He took the parchment from the hands of the monk. Thank you, Brother Francisco. As soon as I have read this, I will let you know what my answer is. Is the message still here? Yes, Bishop. He is waiting for a response from you, which he will transmit back to Rome. Should I prepare bedding and food for the man? Yes. Yes, of course, Francisco. Make sure the man is comfortable and his horse fed, won't you? Very well, Bishop. I will be waiting in your office afterward. You do that, Francisco. I will be along shortly. As soon as the young monk left the refectory, Antonio broke the seal and cut the ribbon that tied the roll. His eyes opened wide as he read the letter. 20th day of November, 1641. To the Bishop of the Province of Aserta, on this blessed 20th day of November in the 1,641st year of our Lord, I, Maffio Barberini, Pope Urban III, hereby invite you, excellent and poious self, Antonio Ricciuli, Bishop of the Province of Aserta, to be ordained Archbishop of Cosenza, in Riggio di Calabria, on the 17th day following the day of the writing of this missive. You will present yourself in Rome at the appointed date, and will follow the instruction of your ordinant priest. Awaiting your reply, I wish all of you blessing of our Lord God and Son Jesus Christ to be upon you. Urban the third. Antonio let the letter drop to the floor. Damianos was quick to pick it up. Obviously neither he nor Constanzo could understand Antonio's dumbfounded look or manner. What is the matter? Constanzo blurted. Let's see the letter, he demanded, practically ripping it out of Damianos's hand. Once he read it, he said, I could hardly believe this, Antonio. Your wish has come true, my brother. You are to go back to Calabria. You are going home. Ha, ha, ha. Blessed be the Lord on high. Antonio turned his gaze to Constanzo and smiled. Finally. I am sorry. I still cannot believe the Lord has heard my prayers. Why would you doubt it at the very moment when you have received proof that our Lord has heard your prayers, son? Damiano said, patting Antonio on the shoulder. 